Amen. Well, God bless you guys. If, you, uh, if you're here for the first time, we started a series two weeks ago, and we're looking at some of the things that Jesus spoke in the book of Revelation. Everybody say, Revelation. Ooh, everybody kind of gets weird when you hear that. Revelation, like, ooh. And there is mysteries in the book of Revelation, and there is symbols, and there is hidden things that, that God spoke, that Jesus and the Spirit of God spoke into John's life to, to prepare us. As a matter of fact, Revelations 1.1, the very first verse says, hear these things that are shortly about to take place. And so he wrote this back in eighty ninety, so it was many, many years ago. But even today, as we've said, and I believe, we are in the end time church. Things are shortly going to take place. And so I believe it's important to see what Jesus wrote to the churches then. There's seven churches. This is our seventh year. There's seven churches, and there was one other seven. You know, seven is a complete number. Um, and so uh, let me switch gears here for a minute. Our seventh year, this is when we're going to go as a GC church general council. Man, I want all you guys to be here. Everybody come. It's going to be an amazing, amazing day. That's the day you get to vote me in or out. I want everybody to be here. <laughs> no, just kidding. But hey, so that's what we've been talking about, looking at some of the things that, that Jesus spoke through John to the original people in the book of Revelation and what it meant for them that doesn't really make a lot of sense to us, some of those things, until we dig into it a little bit. And he was taught, we talked about the, the loveless church, uh, the church of Ephesus, um, the very first church. And they, they were a church, they had all their doctrine right. They were smart. They could find you chapter and verse. They knew scripture, but they had no love. And it reminds me of the church in Corneth where, where Paul was writing through the Spirit of God. And he said, listen, uh, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love understand all prophecy and mystery and, and, and give my body to be burned, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. And so it's good and it's important to know and have sound doctrine, but along with that, there has to be love. And as you know, Jesus, uh, we're going to talk about that today, he doesn't, he doesn't condemn, he convicts and tries to bring people back up. And then last week we talked about the persecuted church, and, and I want to give a disclaimer here. There was some letter demons in the illustration I used last week. Well, forget it then. <laughs> Remember the illustrations with Billy uh, where we put the, you know, the word poverty was spelled wrong? Okay, that was, that was demons, okay? I'm just telling you. It, 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 I think the wind blew and it messed it all up. But we talked about the persecuted church and how... They became persecuted, how, how the, the Jews were, were persecuting the Christians and, and basically tattletailing on them for not doing their temple worship, uh, and they were being thrown into prison, they were being slandered, they were being all these different things, and, and God says, hang in there. I want you as a church to hang in there, to, to take the pressure, and he never offered relief. He just said, be faithful unto the end, and do not fear. And so today what we're going to be talking about in the church we're going to be reading about is the compromising church, the church that compromised. So let me start reading uh, this morning out of Revelation 2.12. It says, and to the angel in the church of Pergamos write, let's stop there for a moment. Again, the angel was the bishop or the elder or perhaps even some theologians believe the attitude of the church. And Jesus is speaking to this church and he's saying, listen, I, I, I know where you guys are at and I'm speaking to you and I want you to get this. The letter was going to be passed around to all the different churches. Uh, and so he was speaking to them. Pergamos was about 65 miles inland from Smyrna, which is what we talked about last week. And so they weren't a coastal land. They were, they were an inward land. But they had the reputation of being the capital of Asia. The capital of Asia. Think of it like this. If Ephesus was the New York uh, of our day, because that's where the, uh, the money was, that's where the big banking system was, where the, uh, the economic status of that whole region was, then, then Pergamos was, was D.C. It was like Washington, D.C. They made the rules there. 
They were the, the, the capital of, of that whole region of Asia, and they were given that capital by Rome. It was one of the very few areas that Rome did not come in and conquer. They came in, and Pergamus just said, hey, you want our city? Here it is. And for hundreds of years, they, they were, they were wor- worshiping and, and, and honored Rome, and so Rome made them the capital of this whole entire area. And so they had a lot of influence this city had a lot and a, a lot of influence amongst all the other cities as a capital would. It had one of the hugest libraries. It's, it's written that there were over 200,000 books in their library. And if you think about that, that was before printing presses. That was handwritten. 200,000 books. There were a lot of things going on in this capital city as would normally go on in a capital city. Um, There were emperor worship, as we've talked about. In all the churches, Jesus addresses that. There's emperor worship. There was the law established as it was in the other churches that you had to take that pinch of incense and throw into uh, the charcoal fire and say, Caesar is Lord. And in most of these seven churches, we've talked about that, and we're going to continue because that was a reality for Christians then. That was the things that they faced but in most of those cities and most where those churches were, it wasn't really like you had to. It wasn't like they were chasing you down in order to do it. But in this city, it was a law. And if you did not take your pinch, and if you did not worship the emperor or go into the pagan temples, if you did not do that, you were put into prison. And we talked last week about what happens in prison. It was not a five-year stint. It was a life sentence when you went to prison. And so it was law for about 20 years when when Nero made the law right around 8060. It was a law and they kept the law. They they it's kind of like it's kind of like <laughs> it's kind of like Canada. Y'all know what's going on there. They had a law but it was kind of lax and now they're keeping the law whichever side you happen to be on on that. But they kept the law and it was hard for Christians. It was hard for the believers in that area to, to worship God. How did, they, how did they get along? How did they do that? How in the world could they have done that? This city was named after a piece of paper called vellum. Vellum was made from animal skin, and they used to write on it. Maybe that's what some of those books were about. But it was a very influential city in the area. And this is who Jesus is writing to. He's writing to the Christians that were oppressed Uh, in this area, writing through the Christians who had compromised in this area. And he goes on to say this uh, in the rest of verse 12. These things, says he, who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now, if you notice, and I hope you do, you go back and look at these letters to these churches because it's what Jesus wrote to them, but he wrote for us. In every one of them, God gives himself at least two titles. Last week, he was the one who was dead and rose again. And in Ephesus, there was two titles. This is the only letter where he only has one title. And the emphasis uh, is because he wanted them to know who he was. He wanted them to know that he was making a statement with that one title. And that statement was both political and cultural, and it was also spiritual. He was making a statement about who he was. This is my title. The one who has the sharp two-edged sword. It was political because Rome, again, was in in charge. And Rome kept the peace by something that was called Pax Romanta, which basically means the peace of Rome. But they kept it through a sword. And, you know, when when I was in law enforcement, we used to teach the young officers, you know, um, you you, you do this thing called pain compliance. You, You hurt somebody enough... Until they comply is basically what it meant. It's pain compliance. You, you, you offer enough pain on somebody until they begin to turn and comply or compromise or do what they really don't want to do. And that's what Pax Romanta meant. It, meant. it meant Rome kept the peace. They got their will done by the edge of the sword. And there were two kinds of swords that we read in Scripture. Uh, one is, and I'm phonixing this out, is a, a makara. And a makara is the kind of sword you see in Ephesians chapter 6, where he talks about putting on the full body armor of God. And he says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And makara was what he was talking about. And it was about an 18-inch sword with a small handle on it. And most of the Roman soldiers 
wore this sword. It was the fighting sword. It was the in close where you got to battle and fight and you kept the peace by just, you know, knocking people on the head. But that's not the word he uses here. And see, we wouldn't know that, but they did. And here's what they were, he was saying to them. He was saying, he was using a sword called a remphira. And a remphira sword was a sword that had a two-foot handle on it and a three-foot double-edged blade. You had to wield it with two hands. And it said that if you were someone who was a good swordsman, if you could wield that sword good enough, you could cut through a metal shield. Not to gross anybody out, but you could cut through almost an entire horse if it was running at you full blast. That's the power that this sword had. And that's the word Jesus is using to this church who had compromised their conviction, they compromised their beliefs, they compromised, they went along to get along. And he's saying, I'm the one that's got the sharp from Rephara, the two-edged sword. It's a word of judgment. It's, he's, he's saying, I have a, a strong word of judgment. But it's also a spiritual statement he's making in there. And I want to read to you in the book of Isaiah, where uh, talking about Jesus, it says this, Listen, coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples, from afar. The Lord has called me from the, room, from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. And so Jesus didn't want them to not understand what he was saying. Because what he was literally saying was, listen, I've got the biggest sword. I I got a bigger sword than Rome. I got a bigger sword than Washington, D.C. My word stands above and on top of anything that can come down. How about this? My word is bigger than depression. My word is bigger than pain. My word is bigger than jacked up relationships. I have the biggest word. And I want you to know that. Because before you can offer any kind of consoling or advice or as God is going to do a repentance, before you can offer any of that, you have to know that. You have to know that he has the biggest sword. I mean, Hebrews 4 talks about it, that the word is living and powerful, sharper than a what? A two-edged sword, piercing getting into the division of soul and spirit down where, down where we, we don't recognize with medical journals. But there's a place in our heart where soul and spirit come together. We can't find it. We can't even reach it, but God's word can because his word has the final authority. He goes on to say that his word is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And all things are naked and open to him to whom we must give an account. Hebrews 4, uh, 11 through 13. Man, that's actually good news, folks, that he has the final word, that what he says is going to come to place because he's bigger than Rome. He's bigger than DC. He's bigger than all the things that you're dealing with. He's much, much bigger than that. His word declares that. But this church not wanting to upset the apple cart, began to compromise. They began to follow Jesus and a little bit of temple worship. They began to come on Sunday, the Lord's Day, the Resurrection Day, and they worship like perhaps we worship today, although I don't know, I think we got the best kinkin' worship team in the world But they had figured out a way within themselves where soul and spirit meet. That place that's hard to get to. They had figured out a way how to compromise so that they could do both. So that they could love Jesus and maybe go into Zeus's temple. So maybe they would be okay when they went home and they threw that little bit of incense in the charcoal. And the next day they went to church. They were okay with that. They learned to compromise. And Jesus is saying, my sword, right, my remphira, it's a two-edged sword. It's a sword that pierces, and it gets down to that spot where compromise is. But it's also a sword, sword that lances. In other words, it heals that wound. 
How many of you know God's word is all about redemption? Even when he calls us out, it's about redemption. Every word, every, every parable, it's all about redeeming people, redeeming you, redeeming his creation. And you know why? Because he loves you. Even in the midst of Jesus calling you out, he loves you. It's kind of like when your dad said, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And I'm thinking, no, it's not, dad. <laughs> but I get it now as being a dad. I get it. And I get why he wants us to see this word because compromise, compromise, folks, listen to this. Compromise comes from the arrogance of our heart. Compromise gets in that place down in spirit and soul. It gets in our heart that says, this is my life. This is my money. This is my ministry. This is mine, 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 mine. And it gets in there and it grabs a hold and it's hard to let go. It takes a big sword. It takes a right word to get in there and to do battle with, with that compromise. Jesus was saying to them and for us, I got a word. And it's a word that's going to cut compromise out of the church. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a word that's going to cut and it's going to, to heal. It's a word that's going to judge. He's sending a word of judgment. And listen, I get tired of Christians, and so if you say it, I forgive you, but don't say it again. We're not supposed to judge. Yes, you are. You don't judge someone's salvation. That's not your job. But if you can't judge right and wrong... How are we, as Scripture says, going to be priests and kings of, of this new kingdom? How are we going to be able to make rash decisions if we can't judge what's right and wrong? Sometimes because compromise gets down in the depth of our heart where soul and spirit meet, it's, it's hard to render. We don't want to upset the, the apple cart. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But listen, church, he's not coming back for a compromised church. He's coming back for a pure church. A church that stands on truth, a church that loves people, even the unlovable, and that loves ourselves, uh, uh, and that loves each other. That's the type of church he's coming back for. That's the type of church we need to be. A church that will take his word and, and let conviction, the wound of conviction, be healed by the edge of the lance of mercy and of grace as he pulls that back out and as we begin to stand on that word. And so I spent a little time on that title because that's what he wanted this church to know and I believe it's what he wants the church to know. Above all else, his word is bigger, stronger, more powerful and it will fulfill what he says, exclamation point, enough said. That's what his word is. That's what the sword is. He goes on to say, I know your works and I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and you did not deny faith even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Now there's a lot of thoughts about what this actually means. There was uh, so much temple worship there. Jesus says, I know where you live. And again, he says that to all the churches and he says it to us. I know. I know your pains. I know your heartaches. I know your sin. I know your compromise. I know, I know, I know, I know. Jesus never does not know. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. Means he is all-knowing. El Shaddai, he's all-powerful. He knows. He knows. And even though he knows, he brings a, a, a commendation to them. He says, I know, I know where you live, where Satan's uh, temple is. And, and Satan's temple could have, take a couple different meanings from this text. It could, it could mean uh, the big Greek altar they had for Zeus. There was a, a temple for Zeus that was fairly large. They say it's in a German uh, museum right now. But at the top of it, it's in scripture, it said, Zeus is savior. Can you imagine how that must have been for a Christian? who had just gotten saved by the power of the Holy Spirit coming into his life, eradicating sin, and him knowing down in that place where soul and spirit meet down in the knower of the knower that Jesus had saved him and that Jesus was Savior, he was Messiah. And then to walk by every day this inscription that says Zeus is Savior. It's easy to compromise if you keep inundating yourself, flooding yourself with those things. It could have been that was what he was talking about with Satan's throne. It could have been 
the fact that there was a hodgepodge of cultures in this particular city. There were Greeks, there were Romans, there were Thracians. There were just a hodgepodge of different cultures with different uh, ethnicities, with different gods, with different thought patterns. And it almost sounds like America. (laughs) Where you have all these different things and we should celebrate our differences. But what happened to them and what's happening, I believe, to the American church is we're allowing all these different gods to come into our life. We're allowing, uh, you know, there was pagan worship there. There was worship to the emperor there. There was worship to, to, uh, to, to God men there. We're going to talk about one of them in a minute. And America has the prosperity gospel. It has the gospel. It has uh, the new age. It has a little bit of stuff that you just throw everything together. And, and what do you have when you got, got all done with it? You ain't got much. You ain't got the gospel. And the gospel, it's the power of God unto salvation. It's not all those other things. There's no other religions. There's, there's, there's no other culture that can say, my God rose from the dead. Come on. That's what Easter's all about. I mean, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then, then maybe for me personally, I would say, well, this is a cool thing and you treat people nice and all that stuff. But, you know, it's, maybe I could find something else that I could, maybe a little bit easier. But he rose from the dead, church. <laughs> It's documented. It's historical. It's proven. If you're one of those science folks, it's undisputed. He is the undisputed first person who rose from the dead. Nobody else can say that or has done that. And so why wouldn't I put my faith in his gospel, not a made-up gospel, not a pretend gospel? But I fear that's where we're at. And I fear this word to this church is for for us as a church collectively, not just Skyline, but we can't, we can't step out of that because we're part of the church today. And, and they, they, he was speaking to them about all these different religions and pagan worship, but the main, the main religion there was a person who some of you may have heard of, especially if you're in the medical field. Uh, a cl- uh, let me sound it out here. Um. I phonics this one to make sure I got it right. Where am I at? I'm not even following my notes here. Let's see. Um, Asclepius. Asclepius. Thank you. I should have looked at you, uh, brother. Asclepius. Asclepius was the god of healing. Why wouldn't he been the main one? <laughs> Done everyone he would want to get healed. He was the god of healing. And, and I think we got a picture of him. Throw him up there if you can. Uh, there he is. He's a looker, ain't he? (laughs) He was a God of healing. And and he was a real figure in history. He was a real person. And apparently he was pretty wise when it came to helping people's bodies to heal them. But there was a temple made for him. And if you see that thing going up his cane, that's a snake. And here was the belief in how you worshipped Asclepius. People from all over the continent. They would come even as far as Roman proper. And they would come and they would get invited and they would go into his temple and they would sleep in this temple at nighttime with the hope that the thousand or so snakes that they let loose in the temple would touch them. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Because there was believed to be some magical, I say demonic, power because I don't know if anybody did get healed. After all, the Satan rep- represents an angel of light at times, doesn't he? He masquerades, the Bible says, as an angel of light. But it was a belief that if this snake or any of those snakes touched you in any certain area of your body, then you would be healed. And people bought into that. Christians bought into that. Because maybe they didn't see, and I love that song, Dorney, even when we don't see that you're working... You never stop. You never stop working. And some of these Christians in this town, in this county, in this city, in this capital, would find themselves in his temple spending the night having snakes go over them so that they could be healed. They compromised. 
And here's what I mean by if you don't think compromise gets in there and grabs a hold. Show that next picture. I'm sure you've seen that. That's where it comes from. I'm not saying that the medical field is Satan. Not at all. I love the medical field. I love Jeanette. I love all the nurses. My sister's a nurse. What I'm saying is this. You see just a little bit of compromise? When it grabs a hold and if it's not dealt with, you see what it can do? It can last centuries. And we have that on our ambulances today and in our medical field. It's a sign of healing. And Asclepius had knowledge to do that. But it's also where Satan lives. It's also in that era, that's where Satan lived. And so we've kept that with us all this year. All these years. And that's what compromise does. It gets in there real easy and it just won't let go. And that's why he's so serious about, listen, get a hold of my word because I want to tell you something. And so he begins to to explain that. But just before he gets to the problem that he has with the church, he makes this cool statement. He says, he says, but basically not all of you, not all of you who live in Satan's throne. Again, he didn't tell him to move. So not all of you who live in Satan's throne are, 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 are compromised. He says, some of you are like my faithful witness, Antipas. Antipas, we don't know a lot about him. Uh, there's only one reference in scripture. There's not a lot of reference in church history, but he was believed to be the bishop or the angel to this particular church between the years of AD uh, 70 and AD 90. We do know that he was killed by being roasted to death. They put him in a brass pot and they had these little horn things that would go off of this offshoot of this pot. I don't know how they put it together. But what would happen is they would roast a person very slowly and the agony of the pain of trying to not put your feet or your skin anywhere where the, where the brass was, was warm. When you screamed in agony, it came out as almost like music. And people would stand around knowing that you're getting roasted, hearing your agony that sounded like music. They were really, really good at torture. Really good at torture. And that's basically all we know about him. But here's one thing we know. Jesus gave him a title. He said, my faithful witness. My faithful witness. You know, if you go back to the first chapter of Revelation, it talks about Jesus, the faithful witness. He gave him the same title that Jesus had. He gave him that same title. Maybe he, was, maybe he was ministering and speaking out against the pagan gods, against Zeus. Maybe he was talking to those compromising Christians. Whatever it was, he lost his life for it. And Jesus reminds us that, hey, he's a faithful witness. He's my faithful witness. And so after setting all that up, Jesus goes on to say in verse 14 and 15, he says this. But I have a few things against you. Because you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So really here was the complaint, here was the compromise. They were committing sexual immorality And they were eating food sacrificed to idols. That's what Jesus is saying. I have this against you. And he references an Old Testament story about a guy named Balaam and a king named Balak. Balak was the king of of the Moabites. And about 40 years, right at the end of the 40 years where the nation of Israel had gone through the, the desert, they were getting ready to come out into that promised land. They had to go through the plains of Moab. And as they were coming through the plains of Moab, the king apparently saw and looked and said, man, there's like two mil- three million people coming across our border. We got to do something about that. I think every king should do that. Pun intended. So he called this guy, Balaam, who was a prophet, a known prophet of the day. And he says, I want you to put a curse on Israel before they cross over. I want you to put a curse on them. I want God to curse them. I know that you're a man of God. Curse them, and so we don't have to deal with them. They don't, they don't eat up our, our food and our livestock and our fields, and they don't, they don't, they don't do any of that. They, they go somewhere else. You curse them. And so if you look in Numbers 22 through 24, you'll see this kind of funny story where, where Balaam, for money, 
decides he's going to do it. And he takes off and he sits on this donkey and the donkey recognizes uh, about three different times this angel that stood in his way to keep him from going to do the curse. One of the times, the angel was standing there with a sword. What kind of sword do you think it was? Yeah, it was that kind of sword, the big one. And finally, Balaam looks at the donkey and begins to have a conversation. I, I liken it to like sometimes how we have conversations with Siri. Um, you know, Siri will speak back to you. Well, the donkey spoke back to him. Many of you know the story, but if you don't, the donkey spoke back to him and said, basically, listen, I've been a, a servant of yours. I've carried you all these places all these years. Why are you now hitting me? Why are you hurting me? And he said, and he said listen, you don't, you don't see what's going on in front of you. And then, then God opens his eyes and God speaks to him and says, listen, I, I want you to go. I want you to do what you were called to do, but only speak what I tell you. I said, okay. So he gets to the king and he says, hey, king, I, I can only speak what the Lord tells me to speak. You want me to call down a curse? Uh, uh, that's what I'm planning on doing. But if God changes my, my words, then that's what's going to happen. And so about four times he begins to curse Israel as they're coming across the plains. And four times, instead of cursing, he gives them a blessing. And he blesses Israel. Because how many of you know God blesses his people? That's what he wants to do, especially when people are cursing you. And so he gives them these blessings, but, but Balaam says, listen, there's a way that you could do this without invoking God. You don't have to invoke him, and I'm paraphrasing a little here. He says, bring some of your women, those, those beautiful Moabite women, bring them here and let them, let them have sex with these Israel men, these men of Israel. Let them marry let them do those things because they are beautiful. I'm told they are beautiful, beautiful women. And so, you know, these women come up. I don't know how it worked out. If it was in a building, if it was in a plane, I don't know. But, but they begin to see these women and these men of Israel who had been walking in the desert for 40 years, see these women and go, dog, <laughs> thank you, Lord. <laughs> we even ascribe some of our compromise to God, don't we? <laughs> God, you brought me this beautiful woman. I mean, you know, I got needs, Lord, come on. And so these women come and they begin to have sex with them and marry them. And listen to what it says in chapter 25 of Numbers at the end of all this. It says this. This is what happened when God spoke his word, sharp-edged sword of judgment to Israel then. He says, the people began to give themselves to sexual immorality with the women of Moab. They invited the people to sacrifice to their gods. And the people ate, talking about the Israelites, the people ate and they bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined with Baal of Pierre, which was one of their gods. It goes on to say, if you read this, listen to this. This is how blazing compromise can be. In verse 6, it says, And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented himself, uh, or presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses. The camp was there. They were crying over their sin. They were upset. God was, ups was, was upset with them, and they were repenting. They were weeping. And this guy, this guy comes, verse 6, he comes with this Midianite woman in the sight of Moses, in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. They were weeping at church. And they go into this tent and they begin to have sex right in the middle of everything else. And one of the priests who had some scruples about him took a javelin in there and it says that they stabbed, him, they stabbed both of them through with one shot. So you know what they were doing. That's what compromise does. It gets so blazing at times. It gets so in your face. It gets so this is who I am and I don't care what you say or think. And I'm not talking about the world. We expect the world to be that way. I'm talking about brothers and sisters. That's what he's talking about. And so he's saying, listen, you guys are just like the Israelites of the Old Testament. You're just like them. You're doing the same thing. But he was specifically speak speaking because his word says, who taught. He was speaking to leaders. He was speaking to the church leaders. He was speaking to the, the husbands of the family. He was speaking to the leaders of ministries. He was speaking to all those different people and saying, listen, you guys have led my people to sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed with idols. And 
God says, in a very cosmopolitan way, I don't go for that. I don't go for that. And nor should you. They were doing all these things and eating, sac- eating food sacrificed to idols was something they addressed in the New Testament. Basically, it was going to a temple and eating as a rite of worship. They sold meat sacrificed to idols in the, in the agora, in the marketplace. And basically, they said, we know that that's just, they're pretend gods. Take that back to your house and eat. It's not a sin. But don't eat food sacrificed to idols in the temple. Don't do that with the pagan people who the pagan gods celebrate, sacrifice, worship their God like they did in Israel. Don't don't do that. That's not what God has called you to. That's not what God has called me to. And so he's addressing this leadership, and I wonder what he would say to the leadership of America today where it's okay to be openly homosexual and behind a pulpit. Not my words, church, his. What is he saying to those who teach those doctrines as if God is, God just loves you, man. Absolutely, don't ever forget that. God will always continually love you until your last breath, you have a choice. But what does it say about the church today? Are we following the doctrine of Balaam? Have we said as church leaders and representatives that it's okay to change your gender? It's okay to do those things? And you don't think God knows? And you don't think God sees? You don't think God sees when, when <laughs> as a story I, I heard of a deacon who, who had his daughter get an abortion because he didn't want anybody in the church to know? Do you think God doesn't see that? And the pain and the hurt that's going to happen in in that family because of their decision. I pray God someone's there to rescue them. I pray God send somebody in there that can have compassion and love and mercy in their lives. Because that's what's needed. But he's talking to the church leadership. And guess what? They didn't want to upset the apple cart. They wanted to avoid confrontation. Again, it goes back to, well, we're not supposed to judge. Yes, you are. You're supposed to say wrong is wrong and right is right, and you do it in love. But we've gotten to the point where we just go along to get along. I'm preaching today, guys. <laughs> I'm not teaching. I'm preaching because we just go along to get along, and I'm telling you, the word of God is going to come as a judgment to the American church. It's going to happen because he's got the biggest sword. Promise you. We don't want to hurt feelings. I've sat underneath pastors who, who have said to my face, well, you know, they're, they're big givers. So let's not rock the boat with them. It's okay if they want to do that. You know, they bought, they bought a bus for the church. Don't, let's, let's let it go. Let it go. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I've sat under leaders who, who, who don't like confrontation, and, and nobody likes confrontation but who won't speak out against wrongs to members. I mean, uh, you know, so what they're shacking up together? Doesn't matter. So what they're they're doing their thing, uh, you know, and they're not married? Doesn't matter. I'm just watching a little bit of stuff on the computer. It really doesn't matter. I'm just taking a little bit and a little bit, and we know what happens. Compromise gets to where soul and spirit meet, and it won't let go. You can't get rid of it. You need the word of the Lord to reach into that spot and to cut out compromise. And as he's cutting it out, he's healing with his mercy along the way because that's what he does. God doesn't condemn them, and we're going to see that here in just a moment. But if we don't start speaking up and speaking out, are you going to have people, can you imagine, can you imagine what these Christians, when when, when they were speaking out against the temple worship, when they were speaking out against Asclepius and, and the snakes, can you imagine what some of the other Christians were doing? <laughs> the ones who felt okay with it? You know, we fight ourselves. I, I heard a long time ago that we, we're our biggest enemy. We put on our armor and we fight against each other, against things we shouldn't even be bothered about. But the things we should be bothered about we tend to shy away from them because, well, that's confrontational. We don't, we don't want anybody to leave the church. 
my gosh, we're starting to grow. Well, my Bible tells me unless the Lord builds a house, those who build it, build it in vain. Compromise. He goes on to say about the Nicolaitans or the Nicolaitans. We talked about that the first week. Basically, it's the same thing. They were, they were basically saying nothing matters but your soul. God's not really interested or cares about your body, so you can do anything you want. You could stop by the temple and, and worship with a, with a female prostitute or a male prostitute on your way home to get to your wife and kids. It's okay. Let it roll. After all, you got needs. It's okay to do those things. It's okay to do a little of this and a little of that because God really only cares about your soul and there's nothing that can be further of the truth. The book of Colossians prays for our our body, soul, and spirit. We're a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit, and we can't detach one from the other. We're, We're not the Trinity. That's how God made us. And he cares about all of it. If he didn't care about all of it, why would, he, why would he provide healing for our bodies? But this is what was being taught, and it's what is being taught today in many of denominations. And I go on record saying that homosexuality is wrong, but God can heal. God can change. God can transform. And even when we don't see that he's working, he's working. And the word spoken might hurt your feelings. That's okay. That's called conviction. And when God takes care of that conviction, I promise you, he'll sew that up with the other side of the sword with mercy and with grace. Because he's got the biggest word and the biggest sword. We have to stop. We have to stop saying, I can't judge you, brother. That's what you want to do. You do it. Don't say that to me anymore, please. If it's about someone's salvation, you have no right. Only God saves. But if it's about a situation where somebody's sinning and you have the ability to speak into that person's life because you're friends, then you should say something. Hey, man, I'm not sure that's the way you're supposed to be rolling. In your own words, in your own way. I mean, doesn't Hebrews say that whom the Lord loves, he disciplines? So... Maybe, maybe he wants us to judge within the house. That's what he's calling us to do because compromise will kill you, I promise you. He goes on to, uh, to say uh, about compromise, but one of the things that uh, I think is the reason we compromise is because it seems, like, it seems like the home team always wins. You know, we're living in this culture, we're living in this society, we're living like this, so you know, we just got to go along to get along. But, but the reality of it is, is the home team seems to win in most sports, sporting events. Uh, there was a study done in 2011 by Sports Illustrated, and they wanted to know why the home team won almost 80% of the time. So they looked into the fans. Was it the fans screaming, that, that 12th man in the stands? And they came to a conclusion that uh, all, over multi-sports that that wasn't the case. They looked at the climate, you know, a southern team uh, going up against a, a northern team. They're not used to the climate. And, and they realized that that wasn't the case because all the, all the matrix were the same. The, the fields were the same no matter where you're at. And they began to look at, at uh, you know, the, the different playing fields. Was it have something to do with the fields? And there was nothing there. And they came to a conclusion after much study, by the way, that the reason the home team wins most of the time, 80% of the time, is because of the umpires, because of the referees. Because even unbeknownst to them, now some of you, I know, we look at the screen and we say, I know you're getting paid to make that call. But most of the time, the reason they win is because the referees, they get turned by what they hear in the stands. They hear someone screaming and they live in this camp town and they, they shop with, they shop with this, this guy's mother. They're going to get a call when they get home after the game. So, you know, maybe we just ease up a little bit. And it's become such a compromise. And I'm not saying if you're an umpire in there, you do that. But the, the statistics don't lie. The statistics said 80% of the time it's because of the referees. And again, I don't think they know that they they do it, but it's kind of like that frog in the water. You put him in the water and you turn it up a little bit at a time, and guess what? For long, he's boiled. And we live in a culture and a society that is becoming and is, I would might say, anti-Christian. And it's so easy to go along and get along. 
It's so easy to just say, that's okay. That's good for you. When we do that as referees for kingdom business, we, we fail. And we fail miserably. And that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to push back. Push back against the darkness. I'm like, we, we sing the songs, we scream, we shout, we loud, and that's all good. We get Rick running up and down the aisle, but that's all good. Here, what are you going to do tomorrow when your buddy says, hey, what'd you preach or preach about? And this guy's been shacking up with this girl for the last 10 years. Uh, well, he said something about shacking up. Well, I don't believe in that stuff. I mean, why do you even listen to that stuff? Well, what do you have an answer? What's your answer? Is it just good for you or good for me? Or is it, you know, maybe that's not what God wants. He instituted marriage for a reason. So that one man and one woman would leave, come together and become one. There's a reason behind that. We need to start pushing back against that darkness. And lastly, this morning, uh, he goes on to say, can you hear what I'll do? Can you hear what I'll do? He says, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on that stone a new name, which no one knows except him who receives it. He says, repent. Repent. Turn around. Go away. Go the other way. That compromise that has happened in your life and in my life, turn from it. Repent, that's what it means, to, to turn from it. God's grace does not condemn us. God's grace convicts us. And it's not a hyper grace that says, I can just do anything I want and God's gonna forgive me. No, the book of Colossians teaches us that grace, grace is a teacher. And it teaches us to, to follow and to listen to the word of God in the direction that he wants for our life. It convicts. That sharp two-edged sword, it can get down to where soul and spirit meet. It can get to that place where compromise is holding on. And he goes, here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you some of that hidden manna. And if you're familiar with the Old Testament, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they were freed, they got saved. They, they spent 40 years in this desert and they began to complain. I wish we were going back. And basically, uh, they said, we don't have any food to eat. And guess what God does? He provides. And he showered every morning the area where they were at with this stuff called manna. It's called angel food. They ate angel food. And he prepared and he provided for them and it brought them empowerment and strength and blessing and it brought them all these things in their desert time. And that's what he does for us. That's what he does for those who repent and overcome. Do you hear what the Spirit is saying to the church? Do you hear what the Spirit is saying to you that he will feed you in your desert time. He will provide. He is the provider. It's like Jesus with the woman at the well uh, in John chapter four where, where the disciples come and Jesus has been talking to her. She'd been shacking up with about five dudes and finally he talks to her and she gets saved and she becomes a hometown evangelist. That's how good God is. And the disciples come back at the end of that conversation and they say, what are you doing? What are you doing talking to this Samaritan woman? And they're like, well, uh, do you want anything to eat? And he says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. You know nothing about, but he provides it for you and I in our desert place. He goes on to say, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. That's our food, that's our substance that keeps us strong and going. He says, I'll give you a white stone with a new name. White stones were very important in that culture. They were used for, for court proceedings. If you were found Innocent, you were given a white stone. If you were found guilty, you were given a dark stone. If you were, uh, uh, there were, there were votes in certain circles that if you had the white stone, it's a yes vote, and a dark stone is a no vote. But the most important thing that they'd had was, was anytime you went to a banquet, if you were invited to a upscale, remember it's the capital, an upscale kind of banquet, you would re receive a, a white stone and it would have an inscription on it. And, and it would basically have the inscription of, of where to go, what, when to come, what time. That was your ticket. And white, white stones were important in that culture. You didn't just throw it away. Sometimes when they, they won uh, athletic contests, they got the crown and they got a white stone. 
And Jesus is saying here, I'm going to give you the hidden manna and I'm going to give you something important. I'm going to give you a white stone and it's an invitation. It's an invitation to a banquet that will outmatch any banquet that you can ever find in Pergamos. I promise you. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I want to give it to you. If you repent and if you overcome, I want to give it to you. You know, there's nothing like someone calling you by your name, giving you that pet name. Who had pet names growing up? I read a story recently about some girls in India, 285 of them, actually. And they had been left at the dumpster. Um, Girls in that culture, even today, are not as important as boys. And they, they had been left, and so this, this, I believe it was a Christian group, I never could get it from the article, but I believe it was a Christian group, came in, and they took these girls, and they cleaned them up, and they, they, they showered them, and they did their hair all up, and, and all this different stuff, and they, 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 they made them nice, because see, what they called them was Nakosha, and Nakosha means in that language, unwanted. Can you imagine that? Come to dinner, Unwanted. Unwanted, go to your room. Unwanted, quit doing that. You're unwanted. So this group comes in and they clean them up and they, they, they make them princesses and they give them a certificate. And on the certificate, they gave each and every one of them, 285 of them, a brand new name. And it wasn't unwanted. One of the girls asked if she could name herself, and, and, and they said, sure, and so on her certificate, she wrote what turned out to be very tough. She was very tough as she had her name changed after all those years. God wants to give you a new name. He convicts for our compromise. And I dare say many of us in here have compromises in our life. We've compromised our convictions. We've compromised our beliefs. It's just been easier to, to not be a father to a daughter and just kind of try to get along. Not be, parents, you know, we just, we ain't got time anymore. We got to work. We got to make money. Listen, God will deal with your compromise. And when he does, here's the beauty. It gives you a new name. I don't know, maybe it's, Maybe it's like Antipas. Maybe it's faithful witness. Maybe it's well done, good and faithful servant. Nobody knows except you. He speaks directly to you. So this morning as we begin to sing, I want you to take a moment and search your heart. And I want you to search, Lord, and this is, a, this is real. This is real with God now. Is there compromise in my life? Have I compromised your word? Have I compromised your values? Have I compromised the convictions that I stand for? And if you have, repent. Repent. And hear the Holy Spirit calling you by a new name today. Maybe, maybe Jesus has never been in your life maybe you've been unwanted all your life or at least you felt that way today he wants to give you a new name and substance man of food that will carry you through this journey to the next he wants to save your soul but you have to repent this morning if you've never repented of your sins if you've never said God I Man, that sword, it, it, it got there this morning and, and I need to let this stuff go. Will you take it and, and, and am I assured that it's not going to kill me? No, it's not. Because the sword of the Lord gets down to our conviction and it pulls it out and it leaves the mark of mercy and the cut of grace on our hearts. So if that's you this morning, we're going to sing this song. And I want you to take some time. Listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you. What is he saying to you at this moment? Do you need to get right with God? Do you need to let go some of those
compromises that you know you have and Jesus knows you have. Nobody else does and nobody needs to know. He knows. This morning, let's bow our heads for a moment. Let's listen to the Spirit of the Lord speak to us.